Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplify, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 13th February 2018. Now, let us begin. Now, from page 1, the first news we would be analyzing would be about INS Chakra. Now, INS Chakra was recently damaged and a Russian team which had visited India to assess the damage has given its estimate for repair. Now, but what is important from your UPSC point of view is to get an overview about INS Chakra. Now, INS Chakra is a nuclear propelled submarine, meaning that it uses a nuclear power plant for energy. And because of this, it allows INS Chakra to stay underwater for almost an indefinite period. Now, this is because diesel powered submarines need to surface to recharge. And because INS Chakra derives energy from nuclear power and because INS Chakra derives power from nuclear energy, it is able to stay underwater for a very long time. And because of this, it allows it unlimited operationability. Now, INS Chakra is one of the quietest submarines. Now, INS Chakra has been taken on lease for 10 years from Russia. Now, INS Chakra is also an Akula Class 2 nuclear attack submarine. Now hopefully up till here you have understood that INS Chakra is a nuclear propelled submarine which allows it to stay underwater and thereby providing almost unlimited operationability. Moreover, you also understand that it is an Akula 2 class nuclear attack submarine which has been taken on lease from Russia. Now a question was asked in your UPSC prelims examination of 2016 which had asked for the description of INS Asradharni. So if a similar question is asked about INS Chakra, you would be able to answer. Now with this, we move on to our next article. Now we have taken this news from page 7. Now what this article talks about is the India State of Forest Report of 2017. Now let us understand further about this report. Now this report has been published by the Forest Survey of India, which is under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Now the first India State of Forest Report was published in 1987. And this current 2017 report is the 15th report overall. Now hopefully up till here, you have understood as to who publishes the India State of Forest report. You also understand that it is under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change that the first report was published in 1987 and the current 2017 report is the 15th report overall. Now let us understand as to what the report covers. Now the current report covers the state and district wise forest cover, the changes in forest cover as compared to previous assessment. Now the previous assessment was based upon the report of 2015. Now the report also measures the growing stock within and outside forest areas. Now stock means the volume of all living trees in a given area and which is based upon specific height and breadth criteria. Now the given area measured in this report is of two types within and outside forest areas. Now the report also measures tree, bamboo and mangrove cover. Now the report also measures the decadal changes in water bodies. Now it means that the water bodies that are available in the forest, their area and volumes are compared to previous assessments. And this assessment, by the term decadal, it means of 10 years. Now the report also has a chapter on forest fires. Now in terms of measurement, it measures the real-time monitoring of forest fires, the burnt areas of forests that have been affected by forest fires, and it also monitors the pre-fire alerts that have been given out. Now the report also gives an assessment of the production of timber from outside forest areas. And the last point is that the report also measures the carbon stock. Now this carbon stock is used in deciding target for India's INDC or the intended nationally determined contributions. And this carbon stock is reflected in India's national communication to the UNFCCC. Now hopefully you have understood the 8 points that the India State of Forest Report 2017 covers. You also understand as to what is meant by stock and why the measurement of carbon stock is important. Now in the news article and otherwise also, you would hear two different words. One is forest cover and the other is recorded forest area. Now let us understand the difference between them. Now let us first understand as to what is forest cover. Now forest cover includes all land which are of more than one hectare in area and have a tree canopy density of greater than 10%. Now in this image, the first section gives an example of a very dense forest which has a canopy density of more than 70% while the second image gives an example of a moderately dense forest which has a density of more than 40% but less than 70% while the third image gives an example of an area which has a canopy density of 10% but which is less than 40% and the last image gives an example of a canopy density of less than 10%. 
Now this image is for representational purposes and give you a pictorial understanding as to what is meant by tree canopy density. Now forest cover includes orchids, plantation, etc. And it doesn't matter as to for which purpose the land is being used or whether the state government or the central government or it is of private ownership. Now hopefully you have understood as to what is forest cover. Now let us understand as to what is forest area. Forest areas or recorded forest areas are geographical areas recorded as forest in government records. Now it includes protective forest under the India Forest Act of 1927 and moreover recorded forest area include any protected forest that have been specified under state or local laws. Now under recorded forest area blank areas are excluded. Now these blank areas are such as wetlands, rivers, grasslands etc. Now the question is why have these areas or these blank areas been excluded? Now these areas have been excluded because they are not part of the definition of forest cover. Now the definition of forest cover has already been given to you. Now wetlands, rivers, grasslands, these areas generally don't have a tree canopy density of more than 10% and that is why they have been excluded in recorded forest area. Now hopefully you have understood the difference between forest cover and forest area. Now let us understand the outcome results that have been highlighted in this report. Now the highlighted positive outcomes of this report is that there has been around 1% increase in forest and tree cover in India and more importantly this increase has been seen in very dense forests. And it is important because these very dense forests act as carbon sink. Moreover water bodies have increased inside forest. And finally the mangrove density in India has also increased and additionally no specific mangrove sites in India have shown a decrease in their density. Now hopefully you've also understood that, that there has been a 1% increase in forest and tree covers especially in very dense forests that the water bodies inside forests have increased and that the mangrove density in India has also increased. Now hopefully this section has given you an overview of the India State of Forest Report of 2017. So hopefully if a question is asked in your prelims or your mains examination within the environment section you would be able to answer. Now we move on to our next article. Now we have taken the lead editorial from page 8. Now the July Kattu issue has been referred to a constitution bench and that bench would decide as to whether the state on behalf of its citizen can claim protection of culture and tradition under Article 29 Clause 1. Now the July Kattu issue is subjudicious in nature and therefore we would not focus on the political or the cultural part of the July Kattu issue. Now we have covered the July Kattu issue in an earlier DNS and its reference to Article 29 Clause 1. Now let us revise this. Now the July Kattu issue has been made by Navesa and is in the January edition of the Focus magazine. Now July Kattu is a bull taming sport and is played as a cultural event in the state of Tamil Nadu. And similarly, many other states have such bull taming activities as a form of a cultural event. Now the Supreme Court in the year 2014 had banned the practice of July Kattu. Now after that, the Supreme Court was looking whether a state can claim constitutional protection under Article 29 Clause 1. Now let us first understand about Article 29 Clause 1. Now Article 29 Clause 1 is a part of the fundamental rights and states that any section of the citizens residing in the territory of India having a distinct language, script or culture of its own shall have the right to conserve the same. Now this fundamental right is intended for the protection of interest of minorities. Now the question becomes that do states have a right under Article 29 Clause 1 to preserve a cultural practice as a fundamental right? But from this article and this section, understand two things that Article 29 Clause 1 specifically designed for citizens and has three basic criteria, language, script or culture. And the Supreme Court would be deciding whether states have that right or not. Now let us wait for the verdict of the Supreme Court and therefore we move on to our next article. Now we have taken this article from page 9. Now what we would analyze in this article is the report of the International Labour Organization Global Estimates of Modern Slavery, Forced Labour and Forced Marriage and then we would understand the Trafficking of Persons Bill of 2016 and then end on what has been the argument of the author. Now let us start with the International Labour Organization report. Now this report was a collaborative effort between three organizations. The first being the International Labour Organization, the second is the Walk Free Foundation and the third and the last one is the International Organization for Migration. Now according to this report, there are around 40.3 million modern slaves of which 24.9 million are of forced laborers 
and 15.4 million of forced marriages. And according to this report, around 61.7% of these modern slaves are in the Asia and the Pacific. However, the government of India was very unhappy with this report and also registered a protest at the International Labour Organization. Now this was because even though that this 61.7% was classified as being in Asia and Pacific, it was inferred that the majority of this figure is from India and that is why the government of India was unhappy with this report. Now according to the International Labour Organization, forced labour means all work or service which is enacted from any person under the threat of penalty and for which the person has not offered him or herself voluntarily. Now this is the definition of forced labour by the International Labour Organization. Now modern slavery has not been defined legally but refers to a situation of exploitation that the person cannot refuse or leave. And a person can be forced into modern slavery through the use of threats, violence, coercion, deception or abuse of power. And in the context of this report, modern slavery covers forced labor, debt bondage, forced marriage, human trafficking, or other forms of slavery. Now hopefully up till here, you have understood by whom the global estimates of modern slavery has been prepared. You also understand the various statistics as has been given in this report. You also further understand as to what is meant by forced labor. And you also understand as to the five points which this report uses as indicator for modern slavery. Now let us understand the second aspect of this article which is the trafficking of persons bill of 2016. Now the objective of this trafficking of persons bill of 2016. The first is to prevent trafficking of persons. The second is to provide protection and rehabilitation to victims. And the final objective is to create legal, economic and social environment against trafficking of persons. Now apart from this, India has other laws to combat trafficking. The first is the Indian Penal Code Section 370, which punishes trafficking, which includes fine and not less than 10 years of being in jail. And this may be extended to a jail term of lifetime. Now apart from this, India also has the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act of 1956. But according to the author, India needs to do more to prevent and combat trafficking. And with regards to which, the author has made six points. Now the first point that the author makes is for effective implementation of the current laws. The second point that the author makes is improved labor inspection. And this labor inspection should also be there for the informal economy. The third point that the author makes is about corporate accountability. Fearing corporate offices, factories, etc. should be held responsible if they do not provide decent work conditions. The fourth point that the author makes is to enforce rural employment guarantee legislation. And the fifth and the last point that the author makes is to protect migrants. According to the author, by implementing these features, India would be able to achieve the sustainable goal number 8.7. Now the sustainable goal number 8.7 refers to taking immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, end modern slavery and human trafficking and by 2025 end child labor in all its form. So according to the author, India should not follow the raid rescue rehabilitation model that has become part of the trafficking of persons bill of 2016. Now according to the author, the new laws should focus on a more holistic socio-economic parameters which includes forced marriages, modern slavery, among other measures and through which we would be able to achieve the sustainable goal number 8.7. Now this section becomes important for your UPSC mains examination in the social issues section which specifically deals with human trafficking. Now with this, we move on to our next article. Now we have taken this article from page 9. Now this article focuses on two aspects. The first is the reason for failure of adaptation project. And the second, the article gives various measures which can be taken to avoid these failures. Now let us understand the reasons for the failures of these adaptation projects. Now the first reason given by the author is enclosure. Now it means that when private agents acquire public assets or the authority over those public assets. Now the author has given the example of seizure of land. Within the form of an example, a desalinization plant was constructed in Australia, but the land over which it was made was seized from Aboriginal community and was given away to private actors. Now this also occurs in India, where for the protection of forest or forest areas, forest areas or forest land is taken away from the tribals that are living there. Now the second reason given by the author is of exclusion. 
Now under this, some stakeholders are excluded or marginalized. Now the author has given an example of wherein local communities are not heard or taken part in the decision making process. Now in this the author has given an example of Norway wherein there was low representation of communities when the Norwegian government formed a coastal planning process. Now the third reason given by the author is of encroachment wherein adaptation projects end up interfering with the environment itself. Now the fourth and the last point given by the author is of entrenchment wherein the adaptation projects end up worsening the conditions of the marginalized groups there. Now fully up till here, you have understood the four reasons given by the author which leads to failure adaptation projects that intend to combat climate change. Now to combat these failures, the author has given two proposals. The first measure that the author has given is to take informed consent of the affected and the marginalized group. And the second measure that the author recommends is to form social impact assessment Wherein the socio-economic conditions of the marginalized groups, the future impact that these adaptation programs might have and the local power struggles that exist should be taken to form a social impact assessment. Now hopefully you also understand the two measures that the author recommends to ensure that the adaptation projects do not fail. Now if you take a look at the UPSC syllabus, the failure of adaptation projects and measures to improve it would fall under your GS paper 3 under the environment section and most specifically conservation and environmental impact assessment. Now with this we move on to our next article. Now we have taken the data point from page 9. Now what this data point talks about is the financial secrecy index. Now this financial secrecy index ranks jurisdictions or countries ownership registration. The second indicator is legal entity transparency. The third indicator is integrity of tax regulation. The fourth indicator is financial regulations. And the fifth and the last indicator is international standards and cooperation. Now the purpose for this financial secrecy index is that it is a tool to understand global financial secrecy and primarily to understand tax havens and thereby giving an indication of illegal financial flow or capital flight. Now this financial secrecy index has been formed by the Tax Justice Network. Now according to this index, the first rank is of Switzerland and India ranks at 32. Now it means that higher the ranking, more the secrecy. Now hopefully up till here you have understood as to who prepares the financial secrecy index. What are the five indicators that the countries are ranked upon and what is the main purpose of this index? Now questions have been asked in your UPSC prelims examination such as which of the following brings out the consumer price index? Which of the following has declared the ease of doing business index? Who prepares a global financial stability report? Now these questions have been asked from the 2015 and the 2016 prelims examination. And similarly a question can be asked as to who prepares the financial secrecy index and you should know that it is the tax justice network. And this index was recently launched on 30th January 2018. And so now we move on to our next article. Now we have taken this article from page 11. Now as you might know Prime Minister Narendra Modi was on a tour to West Asia and visited Jordan, Palestine, United Arab Emirates and Oman. Now let us understand about the visit to Oman. Now the first highlight of this visit is that India and Oman would work together to isolate sponsors of terrorism. And moreover both countries would coordinate efforts against terrorism. Now the second highlight of the visit was that eight memorandum of understanding were signed. Now the three main memorandum were for legal and judicial cooperation, cooperation in the field of health and for the peaceful use of outer space. Now the third highlight of the visit was that India and Oman would jointly form an India-Oman joint fund. Now this fund would be used to raise funds for investment in both nations. Now the fourth highlight of the visit was to finalize a bilateral investment treaty. Now the objective of this treaty is to promote and protect bilateral investment. Now the fifth highlight of the visit was that Oman would join the International Solar Alliance. Now the sixth and the last highlight of this visit was of strategic oil reserves. Now strategic oil reserves are inventories or stockpiles of oil which are held by the government of any particular country to safeguard the economy against an energy crisis which might occur during a national security emergency or any other reason. 
Now India has invited Oman to participate to participate in the formation and maintenance of India's strategic oil reserves. Now hopefully you have understood the six major highlights of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Oman. Now Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to West Asia would be covered in the upcoming March edition of the Focus magazine. Now with this we come to an end in the analysis of today's paper. Now let's move on to the question for today.